Good evening. Once again, I'm Stephanie Rule. The deal for a hostage release has brought hope, but now new worries for families of those kidnapped by Hamas. Many of those families were anticipating reunions with their loved ones after initial reports suggested at least some hostages could be freed as early as tomorrow morning. But late today, Israel's government said there will be no release before Friday. My colleague Keir Simmons has all the details. Tonight, a delay to the long-negotiated break in Gaza's bloodshed. The hostage release, including three Americans and potentially many children, will not happen before Friday. Three-year-old Abigail Moore Idan may be among them. Her parents were killed. Our emotions are just going a little more crazy because it does feel like we're closer. The delay, despite the head of Mossad in Qatar tonight, to agree final details of 50 hostages to be freed over four days. The aim to release 100 hostages, officials say, and 300 Palestinian prisoners, teenagers and women, some jailed for minor offences, others for attempted murder. A day of frantic phone calls for families like the mother of Mia Shem, forced to appear in a hostage video, hoping their wait will soon be over. It's like a Russian wallet. We are waiting to see, to see who will come back home. Prime Minister Netanyahu had hailed the deal, saying it included visits by the Red Cross to the other abductees, though Israel's Prime Minister vowing a short pause would not end the war. While Hamas today releasing another video of fierce fighting. Truckloads of aid are planned, but today there was no end to the civilian suffering. They are massacring us before the truce, this man says. Meanwhile, Pope Francis heard directly from both Palestinian families living through the fighting in Gaza and Israeli families whose loved ones are being held by Hamas. My colleague Ann Thompson has more from Rome. At his private residence, Pope Francis met separately with families of Israeli hostages and Palestinians with relatives in Gaza. American Rachel Goldberg's 23-year-old son, Hirsch, was captured October 7th. The number of days he's been gone taped to her chest. I actually said to him, you know, my heart was taken 47 days ago, and I will wear the number on my heart until my heart comes back. She brought a picture of Hirsch and showed the Pope a video of his capture, his lower left arm blown off by a grenade. How did the Pope react to that? Uh, he, he put his hand on his heart and he spoke in um, Italian saying, his heart is with me. Rachel and her husband, John Poland, say today's hostage agreement gives them hope, even if their son isn't freed, because the Red Cross will finally be allowed to see him. The Palestinians say the Pope listened to them about their plight. He can ask for an immediate ceasefire, but this is not what um, the only thing that we ask for. We ask him to use his power for um, more um, a just and long-lasting peace. As we wait for a humanitarian pause to begin, we should note that so far, just five, only five of the more than 200 hostages have been freed. It's only Wednesday, but it has been a very busy week. So here is a taste of what you could hear or on the Thanksgiving dinner table tomorrow. Israel has agreed to a four-day ceasefire. The families of these hostages still do not know whether it is their loved ones who are coming out. You know, it's like a Russian wallet. We are waiting to see, to see who will come back home. It's crazy. This week, it was new House Speaker Mike Johnson's turn to kiss the ring. I think he's sort of making a, a compact with the devil. If Donald Trump is elected president again in 2024, I do fear that it will be the last election where we're voting for democracy. It has been a crazy few days for Silicon Valley. Not even a week since OpenAI's board ousted Sam Altman. He is now returning as CEO, and many of them are ousted. There really is this arms race. Everyone's chasing the same goal. I think there will be huge dividends to the, the company or the platform that gets there first. Let's get this Thanksgiving conversation preheated with some folks that we trust. Brendan Buck is here, former chief communications advisor for both Speaker Paul Ryan and John Boehner, former Republican Congressman Charlie Dent of Pennsylvania, and Victoria DeFrancesco Soto, dean of the Clinton School of Public Service at the University of Arkansas and an MSNBC political analyst. Victoria, welcome to you all. I turn to you first. You know, we keep hearing 
Democracy is at risk. Donald Trump is facing 91 different charges. How could he be doing so well, even in the Republican primaries? And we heard from Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, who said he thinks voters just have Trump brain fog and that's going to clear up closer to election. What do you think about that? That's a yes and answer to that, Stephanie. I mean, yes, we, we need to remind voters of what a Trump 2024 reality would look like, what the future of democracy might or might not be in the United States. But at the same time, you know, President Biden needs to go on the offense. He needs to sell what he has done. He needs to go on the offense in particular on the issue of the border, because we've already seen Donald Trump starting to rev up that engine. And we know that it has played very well with his base, with Republicans. So President Biden has to have a very clear offensive strategy. I would say, hey, just keep pointing to the fact that Donald Trump says he wants to deport everyone. But then in terms of things that he can't control, there's the issue of foreign policy. And here, you know, President Biden, he needs to control the controllables, his domestic agenda, and just keep working at trying to negotiate peace so that Israel and Hamas can come to a more peaceful conclusion. Brendan, people keep saying Biden needs to remind voters of who Trump is. But everybody knows who Trump is. Yeah. He hasn't left the scene. He hasn't stopped talking. Yeah. I mean, usually a year out, you have bad polling. That's what you would say. You, our opponent isn't defined yet. We're going to define him. But people know who Donald Trump is, and a lot of them are still choosing him over Joe Biden. That should be very concerning for them. However, they have, I think, taken a lot of things off the table that they need to reconsider. Obviously, the legal troubles that Donald Trump has had. The White House has basically said, hands off. And I understand why they don't want to look like they're politicizing his, his legal issues. But at some point, you need to take your gloves off against this guy and realize the threat that he is. I do think that there is I do think there is something to the fact that he has been away a little bit and we haven't been reminded of him so much. Donald Trump is probably the biggest turnout driver that Democrats can hope for. And, but they need to realize that they're not going to be able to, to coast through this. You're not going to Joe Biden's not going to win reelection by talking about his infrastructure program. I'm sorry. Talking about your wins. You don't get rewarded like that in politics anymore. But you isn't that insane? Infrastructure roads, bridges, better, faster Wi-Fi would actually make people's lives better and stronger. Isn't that what we want from our elected officials? Isn't that we want? Isn't that where we want our tax dollars to go? I, I don't disagree with you, but what animates people? What animates people more? Infrastructure or Donald Trump and, and the threat to democracy? And, and elections are about animating people and, and, and drawing them out to vote. I think Donald Trump and, and the appeal of him, the threat that he poses for a lot of people, is probably much more animating than roads and bridges in your neighborhood. Charlie, beyond Donald Trump's ride or die base, what is it that he's offering people? Like, I want to know what we're going to hear at the Thanksgiving table tomorrow, because I don't hear him talk or offer any cogent policies. And for anyone who even says, well, I had more money in my pocket during the Trump years, we weren't in the th coming out of a pandemic and we weren't facing one, now two wars. Well, with Donald Trump, you're really not going to get any conversation about public policy. That's not what he's about. He's about anger and grievance. And that's, frankly, Trump's appeal to a segment of his base. That's why they're loyal to him. And he's fighting this culture war, which I happen to find, uh, you know, reprehensible. But it has real resonance with much of our, of, uh, of much of our country. Uh, so Donald Trump, you know, again, he's in a policy-free zone. I've been saying for a long time the Republican Party's all split up. You know, there's the governing pragmatic institutional wing of the party, which is much smaller than this ascendant illiberal populist wing, uh, which is really not about a policy at all, but a grievance. And that's what Trump is doing. And so I think it's going to be another campaign going forward where there's not going to be a whole lot of discussion about policy. And you pointed out earlier, you know, if I were the Democrats, I keep reminding uh, them about Donald Trump, uh, I, the, the voters anyway, because the voters, a lot of them, see Trump as an animating force, as Brendan Buck has just said. He's a turnout machine. They're not going to vote out because they're not going to turn out because they love Joe Biden so much. They really don't like him that much. They're enthused by him, but they really dislike okay, him. Despite... Hold on. Hold, hold on. Hold on, Charlie. They're not going to turn out for Joe Biden. 
this last week, what was it, a week ago, look what people did in Ohio. Look what people did in Georgia. The year before, that big red wave and all those candidates yeah. Donald Trump endorsed, they didn't win. So this narrative that Joe Biden doesn't excite people, I don't know. He became the president, and then he had two really strong midterms. So on what grounds do you say that? Well, on the grounds of, in Ohio, the motivating issue was abortion. It wasn't Joe Biden. I mean, just that's what that's what drove them out. And in, in the 2020 election, people were voting against Trump. I mean, this was a vote against Trump more than it was a vote for Joe Biden. That was pretty clear. And we saw the same thing in 2016, two candidates who are not well liked. And Trump at that time won the double haters. Biden won the double haters in 2020, you know, over people who dislike both Biden and Trump. Who knows what it's going to look like in 2024? Uh, so right now, like I said, you know, Biden is not he's just not motivating his base. They're not enthusiastic about him. They are angry about Trump. And so if I were the Democrats, I would keep pounding away on Trump as much as possible and abortion, because that's what's motivating their base. Victoria, in theory, um, voters like their lawmakers to do something. They like their tax dollars to give them something. Mike Johnson spent his Monday flying down to Mar-a-Lago to see Donald Trump. Donald Trump doesn't want to see Congress get anything done. How does Mike Johnson, as the Speaker of the House, winning over Trump, staying in Trump's good graces, help the American people, help your family and mine? They're going to be talking about what their lawmakers are doing for them tomorrow. It doesn't help the American people, but it helps the Speaker himself. And this might be a good short-term strategy, but it's not a good long-term or even medium-term strategy, Stephanie, because we're looking at the map in terms of 2024 for the House, and it is leaning more and more blue. We see a number of, of, of races, I would say, I think it was about 18 at last count, where there was a Republican in a seat where Joe Biden won that area. So we know going into this election, the Democrats already have an advantage. We also know that in terms of some of the districting cases that have come out, Democrats are again getting an advantage. And the American public is frustrated. They are frustrated at the shenanigans we have seen, and they want folks to do something. So this is not going to bode well for the 2024. Maybe for, for the short term it works, but not the long they're frustrated about things like gun safety that pull overwhelmingly in one direction, yet we do so little.